There all, um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this webinar uh, for the special issue on digital platforms for development in the information systems journal. Uh, my name is Peter Nielsen and I'm an associate professor here at the University of Oslo. I'm also a senior editor of the information systems journal and together with Professor Brian Nicholson from the University of Manchester and associate professor Johan Sabe from the University of Oslo, I have contributed as a guest editor of this special issue. My role today will be to give a brief introduction to the agenda and guide us through the program. We will start today by an introduction from the special issue editors by Brian Nicholson. After this, the authors of the three papers in the special issue will present their work. After that, and finally, we will also have a question and answer session. So you will need to keep your questions and comments until the end. The Q&A session will be moderated by Johan Sabe. As you can already see in the webinar controls, we have opened up the Q&A functionality uh, in Zoom. So feel free to write your questions there uh, or upvote questions from others during the presentations. You can also raise your hands in the webinar controls during the Q&A session if you would like to give comments or ask questions, and we will eventually allow you to speak. As you may have noticed, we are recording this webinar. We will stop the recording after the presentations of the papers, so the Q&A will not be recorded. The recording will be made available after this webinar. So this was my brief introduction. And then I give the word to uh, uh, Brian Nicholson um, to give uh, um, um, an introduction um, to uh, our special issue on digital platforms for development. All right, thank you, Petter, and welcome to everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, thanks to the authors uh, for all the work they've put in on, on these papers, which I think are valuable contributions to the debate. I also want to thank Robert Davison, who is the editor of the Information Systems Journal, for his support with this, and particularly to the associate editors and the anonymous reviewers that have helped us uh, through this process. Uh, we've named the associate editors, but not the reviewers, but your, your help is, is definitely appreciated by all of us. Um, I, I first encountered this, this term digital platform a few years ago, and uh, it was via a, a series of events that were organized by my colleague Richard Heeks. Um, in a network called Diode, the development implications of digital economies. And we traveled around, Carla was speaking next, um, was also involved in that. And I think it was her work that, that spurred me on actually uh, through that uh, Diode network debate. Um, and that was when we first really started to understand the, the complexities of digital platforms and the void that existed in, in development, particularly. Now, as I'm sure you know, that there have been, I'm going to move to my next slide. There have been uh, very significant contributions in this area, uh, in economics, accounting, entrepreneurship, management and information systems and more. However, I, I, I would argue that when we look at these contributions and you know, we can name Jeffrey Parker's work, which is really great, Michael Cusimano and Alabella Gower's books, um, a special issue in information systems research. Those always have been really pivotal in our understanding of digital platforms in information systems particularly. But my work uh, in the IFIP 9.4 group implications of uh, information and digital technology for development has focused on that particular area. And we in that community felt that a gap 
existed on platforms viewed through that lens. But that's what spurred on this uh, this special issue um, was to make sense of uh, of a digital platform through that lens of development. But I think first of all we need to understand what we mean by digital platforms for those that have uh, are perhaps new to the area. And I, I could have drawn on some of those mainstream um, definitions from management strategy or whatever, but I've drawn on one in, in the editorial the OECD, which quite, is quite a broad brush um, definition. Uh, now you can read that, of course. Uh, I'm not going to read it out to you. But what that brings in is a whole range of different possibilities for analysis of big work, of digital marketplaces, music sharing, dating, etc. Uh, so it leaves us a broad brush to examine the area. What we're particularly interested in here is, is development and conceptualizing development. In the editorial, we, we do give a, a, a high level um, a description of the paradigms of development. And, and we settle on the, uh, the 17 sustainable development goals. Now, I'm not going to go into this partly because uh, Carla Bernina and colleagues do a very good job in their paper of analyzing this. So we're delighted when that came through in the paper. Uh, what I want to do is just to take you through some highlights of the editorial. Um, and what the editorial tries to do is showcase these papers, but also point to some dimensions of platforms and development. So, so first of all, the question we, we're trying to answer is, can platforms facilitate development when viewed through the lens of the SDGs? And working at the University of Oslo with, um, with Petter and Johan, of course, I'm, I'm a, a technological optimist, perhaps a cautious, critical technological optimist, but for any of you that know the work of, of Oslo and the DHIS2 platform, uh, we, we um, are optimistic that platforms can facilitate development. But this particular quote here indicates from Davis 2013, that there's probably never been a better time, an easier time to start a digital business. And if we look at the literature, it, that, is, that is definitely uh, a feature of, um, uh, of this period, that it would appear that platforms definitely can facilitate development due to the lens of ec the economic uh, dimension. So if we look at some of these examples from entrepreneurship, uh, Chrysanthi Abgaru's study of Taobao entrepreneurs setting up is a very good example of that, that provides um, evidence that there is uh, platforms and development. And my own work in, in gig work, uh, along with, with PhD students, the, 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 the great Ryan Gerseva, my friend at Virtual Ahan, who specializes in platform gig work, disabled people in the Philippines, is a really good example. Um, and if you go to the website of Virtual Ahan, you'll see stories of disabled people whose livelihoods have been significantly improved. Um, other work, for instance, for Isa Malik, another of my students, um, looking at uh, Uber Karim in Pakistan, which has shown livelihood improvement and female empowerment. And then another example uh, of our labs that I encountered through Richard Heeks's um, my old network where in the Cape Flats area of Cape Town in South Africa, there is an organization that specializes in training uh, marginalized people um, to, to, to engage in app development, um, to actually engage in digital startups and platform work and platform creation. And it's a very inspiring place to, to visit, which I did have the pleasure of doing a few years ago along with, um, with members of that dialed network. So there are, there, along with other examples that I've put into the, into the editorial, we can see lots of potential of uh, platforms uh, and, the, and, the, and the SGGs to um, facilitate development. However, the, the, the story doesn't end there. And um, we look at some of the more pessimistic or perhaps more critical literature in the area, uh, we can see that there are uh, some serious indications that there are, are, are detrimental effects that are definitely not um, 
are facilitating the SDGs. The Frightful Five platform of Monopoly, for instance, um, the Frightful Five in, is, a, is a, a, a collective term for the largest platforms that I'm sure you're familiar with, and the critique of them uh, as forming a monopoly position and the recent uh, uh, case of Facebook and the rebranding and the whistleblowing and the, the accusations of hate speech are one dimension of that. Uh, but the monopoly position is, is uh, significantly criticised. Um, my colleague Deborah Howcroft in uh, the Manchester Business School has also uh, criticised the potential for app development as, as a, uh, offering a long-term career livelihood for those developers. There's outcast on that. Uh, 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 Krishana Zuboff, of course, has criticized extensively the, the shifts of power from state to platform, calling for regulation and examining the dimensions of surveillance. Furthermore, we're seeing through the work of Connie Roberts, our colleague, um, who has examined the state use of platforms for digital authoritarianism. And then finally, um, You'll see in the editorial that we we provide a flag towards uh, Mark Graham's work in the Fair Work Foundation, which is an analysis of big work. And the last last piece of work I saw from them was an attempt to benchmark uh, all those big platforms against Fair Work principles. And the outcome was rather pessimistic uh, when looking at the overall. So that's that is, is, is the, uh, that's the highlights of our editorial. What I'd like to do now is to hand over. Uh, to the, the authors of the papers to take you through the highlights of theirs. So thank you very much, uh, Brian, for the introduction. Uh, and then I give the word to Carla Bonina uh, and Kari Koskinen uh, to present the paper, Digital Platforms Development for Development, Foundations and Research Agenda. Let me unmute myself and let me present here. Do you see it in the right way or? Almost. There. There, right? Yes, excellent. Good. So again, thank you so much um, um, for this. It's, it's my pleasure uh, here. So my name is Carla Bonina and I'm part of the Startup Business School at the Center of Digital Economy. And as I said, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with my co-authors, Kari Koskinen, Ben Eaton and Annabel Gower to present very briefly this, this uh, paper. We're very grateful for the opportunity uh, and all the help from the, the editors and, of course, the team of reviewers. And also, we're very grateful for the support received for, from the ESRC sponsor network, DIOD, uh, that you mentioned, uh, Brian, and, and the very valuable feedback we, we received um, along you know, different phases of this project uh, for the last couple of, of years. And I can see also uh, good friends and colleagues uh, attending this, this webinar. So what I would like to do today is, again, very briefly to present the, um, the key points of, of our paper is an open access paper um, that is already having a very good reception and we're very grateful and, and, and happy with that. Um, and again, uh, there is a lot more detail, but here you'll have an overview. Um, I think, Brian, you, you touch upon something that was for us very, very uh, important as an empirical motivation of this paper, the role of the big platforms, and as you say, the frightful five or, or the so-called GAFAM yeah, these days, or although I think the F has changed. These global digital platforms uh, are now valued in $10 trillion, right? And just to give you a perspective, that's 10 times the GDP of Mexico which is a very big country. Um, this doesn't mean, of course, that the significant of platforms for development has not been out there. What we found that was precisely a gap um, from the, the, the literature taking this more developmental 
view. Uh, and of course, these platforms do bring a lot of potential to generate social, economic, um, environmental value. Uh, yet this was under study. And we think that part of the problem was this lack of scoping on what digital platforms um, really are. Um, and, and what this object is about, at least very much in our field and information systems and also uh, in development studies. So this was our guiding question, right, for this conceptual piece. What do digital platforms mean for development? We take a, a broad view on development that is a holistic view that goes beyond, of course, economic uh, growth. Um, and encompass these other developmental outcomes, uh, very much exemplified by the sustainable development goals, right? So with that in mind, this paper does three main things, right? The first one is precisely to scope um, this object, right? And to do this, we build from the work of my co-authors in this, in this um, uh, project, um, Annabel Gower from the strategic uh, management um, perspective mainly, and also Ben Eaton from the information systems to provide this uh, characterization of platforms. We have very much these two types, the transaction and the innovation that we think bring a bit more clarity um, to, to our understanding of digital platforms. And what we do there, and there is a lot more detail in the paper, is to explain the purpose, explain the focus that each of them uh, take in the literature, explain the underlying digital characteristics, and that's, as you know, very important for, for our field, also review the basis for value creation and capture, and we provide examples that will link to developmental outcomes. We do not just stop there. We also take on board um, the, the literature on ICT4D and this contextual socio-technical idea to also bring some of the nuances that you have in different stakeholders and platform governance for the purpose of development or the developmental lens. So, the second thing we do in the paper is precisely to use this as scoping to review the literature. As Brian mentioned, there were already lots of studies out there that perhaps would not talk about digital platforms in this characterization. So we tried to map that. We did a, a very comprehensive review on the major uh, ICT for the outlets and also the IS basket of eight. And this is more or less a summary of what we found there. Uh, of course, a lot more detail on the paper, but very much the literature was talking about transaction, very much this matchmaking platforms, right? Uh, that we're, I think, mostly familiar with, rather than the innovation platforms, those that enable other uh, third-party developers to do um, um, new things and they act in different ways. Uh, a lot of the emphasis of these papers were on removing frictions, very much of big importance for um, the global south of the development uh, context. And uh, this is access to information, uh, creation of new markets, for example, in agriculture or, or rural uh, settings. There was also uh, an, a trend on more emergent or nascent um, ideas of you know, just simple platforms. Um, simple in the sense of less sophisticated use of SMEs um, and, and, and ideas like that. And then a bigger presence of what we call non-commercial actors. Of course, this may not be surprising because in the context of development, uh, NGOs, uh, governments, and also you know, big uh, donors have a bigger role uh, there. We also find that uh, the significance of, of context was very important, whether it's in the institutional rules, uh, regulations, the infrastructure, issues of access was very much in the papers. And again, for an ICT4D audience, this uh, is not surprising. Uh, again, a lot more detail on the paper, but this is a bit of a summary of what we found. And with this, we do a third thing. So using the, the scoping of digital platforms and then what we found in the literature, we envisage this 
agenda in the form of six research questions. Um, I'm going to name them here very briefly on indigenous innovation uh, or whether these digital platforms create or destroy institutions, whether the inequalities are actually exacerbated by digital platforms, the fourth of platform alternatives in the sense of are alternative forms of value being generated or created with this more developmental lens, uh, the dark side, Things already, Brian, uh, touch upon concentration of power, surveillance, and and the very you know harmful effects that some of them uh, might be um, doing at the moment. And then a, a last one on the categorization uh, of that we found, you know, transaction and innovation and the context of um, development. So for each of these themes. We define the research question, we explain what this is about, um, and we provide examples or potential directions, whether theoretically or methodologically, or, or even some of the studies that are already tackling some of this for future work. Of course, these six research questions are not mutually exclusive, and you may see a lot of overlaps, for example, within the dark side and concentration of power, we also may find implications on the exacerbation of inequalities or the, the destruction or creation of institutions. So I would like just to oops, finish with a big of a you know, big umbrella or overview of what uh, we think our paper uh, does. First, we think that this is scoping of digital platforms, um, you know, this characterization in transaction and in innovation with all their characteristics, while that might not be new, uh, because it's been already developed in other fields, it's very important for information systems to contribute to this lack of clarity uh, we, we spoke at the beginning. And this is not just for development. We think this is uh, important for the field itself. Uh, we, also, we also think that this um, six research questions together with the scoping will actually help us mobilize a, a better understanding of these developmental outcomes and what digital platforms mean for development and not just in developing countries. Um, with that, um, I'd like to close. There is also this idea of call. Um, we, we were actually, uh, we debated uh, with the team about whether this categorization, for example, that is very well known and developed uh, for from and uh, for the global uh, north, whether it's applicable, whether we need more nuances uh, um, in terms of development. And that's something that, that our paper uh, calls upon. And with the 30 seconds left, and I would like then my co-authors to add something uh, in the Q&A uh, when we have a bit more, more space uh, to say, I'm also leading a, a new book project. It's an edited volume with already great uh, contributors. So if any of you in the audience would like to, to you know, uh, perhaps uh, get in touch if you're working on any of these six areas, do get in touch uh, with me uh, in case it can be considered. And with that, I would like to, to close this and pass it on to the next author. And again, a pleasure being here. Thank you very much. Uh... Carla, and Cardi, then and Annabelle. Then I give the word to Silvia Masiero to present the paper Degenerative Outcomes of Digital Identity Platforms for Development. Many thanks, Peter, and many thanks again to the editors for making this webinar possible and to the other authors for presenting their work. I'm extremely excited to be here today uh, on behalf also of my esteemed colleague, uh, Victor Arvidsson, who is co-author on this paper. Uh, I'm now gonna ask the most asked question of this pandemic, and that is, can you see my screen properly? Excellent. Fantastic. So uh, it is my pleasure to present the second paper in this special issue and also to make uh, connections in between our paper and the rest of the volume. I very see the, uh, I very much see this special issue in uh, as a set of papers in continuity with each other, continuities that uh, I'd be delighted to highlight in my presentation too. Our paper 
is uh, an empirically based work uh, centered on the largest digital identity platforms in the world, that's India's Adhar platform, and it is titled The Generative Outcomes of Digital Identity Platforms for Development. Already from the title, I think you can see a strong link of continuity in between the critical aspects that both Brian and Carla highlighted in their presentations. I want to make a small preamble as I begin this presentation, and that's uh, not that we can discuss in the Q&A, but the very important for our work note that digital identity platforms, that's platforms that encode the demographic and increasingly biometric data of a population of users are platforms themselves. So a digital identity platform works uh, by all means uh, as an innovation platform, as Carla just described. So a digital identity platform, as our paper dissects, uh, uh, consists essentially of a core, so a core in this case uh, consisting in a repository of uh, users' data, demographic, and again, increasingly biometric, boundary resources that make it possible to do what? To uh, enable complementors to build complements of different kinds, as we will see today, upon the core, and thirdly, a set of complementors, be them private, public, non-profit, or of different kinds that we will see that actually develop products and services upon the core. Now, why am I making this point so strongly and why is it underlined in red over there? Is because we noticed in the review that preceded our work that digital identity platforms tend to feature very little in the information systems literature on platforms, which led us to wonder why is it so. But a second and perhaps a generative um, uh, uh, item in this research is the fact that digital identity platforms, which are not so strongly featured in information systems literature, but featured a lot more strongly in, for example, development studies, geography, critical data studies, literatures, are in general widely seen as a means to improve uh, many things, among which social protection systems. A social protection system is very broadly in development studies terminology, a system to reduce livelihood risk for poor or vulnerable, otherwise vulnerable populations. So think we are going to talk about food security today, but think pensions, think health insurance, think emergency assistance to the poor. All of this goes under the social protection umbrella. So why would a digital identity platform that converts uh, people's data into digital data be so important here for two reasons in the development orthodoxy behind them? First of all, because such a platform can, can fight an exclusion error, okay? So if I have the data of all a population, for example, of below poverty line users, I can match their data to their entitlements and make sure people are not excluded from aid, from food um, uh, support, from emergency assistance. At the same time, that's two birds with one stone because I can also include all people that are entitled to the same system and make sure that, uh, uh, for example, someone who is not entitled might not have access to it. Now, the problem is that this is not what we see in practice, in the, especially in the development and data studies literature. So in many ways, and we have a paper about digital identity and refugees just after us, so we will see this more, I expect, but many perverse outcomes have occurred, the main ones being exclusions. So for example, cases of hunger deaths out of people being excluded from digitally mediated food aid, exclusions of, for example, displaced populations that were due to be included in a social protection system and due to being smashed in digital identity were excluded. We have cases like, for example, Kenya's Huduma Namba, where a platform, a digital identity platform was actually blocked by the country's Supreme Court due to the inability to deal with essential issues such as exclusions. And this leads 
us to the research question for our paper, which is how do digital identity platforms enable degenerative outcomes? So degeneration is a key word in our paper. It refers to decline and deterioration of a system. Okay, so deterioration of a system that results in a weaker, in an enfeebled state, state as compared to before. Now, I think I have five minutes, even less. So our data. Um, our data uh, rely on 10-year research work that uh, I started in the year 2010, uh, supervised back then by Shirin, who is here today. Thank you, Shirin. Um, on the Adhar, Adhar is India's digital identity platform. It enrolls over 90% of India's adult population. It consists in the enrollment through a government agency of uh, Indian residents and captures biometric data, that's iris and 10 fingerprints, and produces a 12, a unique 12 digit number for every enrolled resident. The way we study the platform is by its incorporation in the largest Indian food security system, it's called public distribution system. And that's a subsidy system that delivers subsidies to the below poverty line population. So as you see here in my field, pictures on the left, people can go to the shop where food items are delivered, uh, authenticate themselves through their fingerprints and receive based on that authentication their entitlements. Isn't this wonderful? Well, I'll give you an overview of our findings and the, and uh, our findings find essentially two families of results. The first one is in terms of the layers of the social protection system of the public distribution system affected by Adhar. And uh, a lot of the development studies literature focuses on the first layer, access. So the access of the citizen who enters the system. And we did see transformation at this layer. As I've just shown, access has become biometric. However, there are two more layers that, uh, in fact, uh, the literature does not contemplate too much. One is in terms of monitoring. So how the Adhar system changed the monitoring of the system by the authorities at the back end, and very crucially, the development policy. So what we witnessed is not only a transformation of the system itself, uh, but the inscription of the system in a policy that wants to change the subsidy system to a system of cash transfers. Now, where's the degenerative effect that our research has found? So this slide is, I would say, the crux, the core of the research. And the research draws links in between the design for properties of the Adhar. And in effect, we can say one degenerative outcome for each of the layers. At the access level, we did find an issue of exclusion. So a problem of entitled users, uh, a problem that is quite uh, um, confirmed through quantitative studies of the same program, a problem of entitled users finding themselves denied the delivery of rations due to the inability of authentication. So this very much comes from a system that is designed to combat the inclusion error, so I surely won't be able to authenticate in case I'm not entitled, but not so much the exclusion error problem. The two further layers that we find is that monitoring is very much centered through the biometric system at the level of the shop where the person accesses the system. However, not so much at the earlier levels of the supply chain where a lot, a substantial part of the diversion of food items occurs. And a third, and perhaps, uh, and here I finish my presentation because my 10 minutes are up, uh, and a third and deepest layer is the layer of redirectional policy. So what our research documents is very much the fact that redesigning the system biometrically enables what is an ongoing shift from a subsidy system, giving subsidies to people, to a system of cash transfers, so bypassing the food security supply chain entirely, a system that uh, my our qualitative research reveal is for many reasons feared by many of the recipients for issues including the not so easy access to bank accounts and the immateriality of cash as compared to food. 
this wraps up my presentation and this final slide only is my way to um, uh, uh, connect our research to Bonina et al that also conceptualize digital identity as transaction platforms. So that's a debate I really want to have today and in the future. And that links the degenerative outcomes of the Adhar to the discourse on refugees that Shirin is going to embark. So I finish here my presentation with many thanks and handing it over to Shirin. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia. Um, and I then uh, invite Shirin Madden to present the paper Digital Identity as a Platform for Improving Refugee Management. Thank you. Let me just get the presentation up. Can you all see that? Yes, excellent. And is it in the right view? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Screen. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, and in fact, the whole experience for me, the whole journey has been such a learning exercise. So I really want to thank the entire editorial team, um, as well as having organized this webinar. I've learned a lot. Um, I think that as Sylvia was saying, there will be a lot of crossovers, um, especially with the, the point about transaction based and innovation based platforms and the, the point about digital identity as a key driver for platforms. So this is a paper uh, with my colleague Emrys Shoemaker, who um, unfortunately cannot be with us today. And um, I think it was the sheer intensity and the scale of the refugee crisis um, and the response to that by humanitarian organizations um, to be able to transform their earlier legacy information systems into digital platforms. And this entire momentum and trend, which is underway right now, uh, is something that inspired us to, uh, um, to study this, this particular aspect of digital identity as a platform for improving refugee management. So um, the case was based on UNHCR, which as you know, is the lead, leading global agency. It has the, the mandate for uh, protecting refugees across the world. And in 2018, um, UNHCR introduced its um, uh, digital identity platform for improving the way in which it managed uh, refugees. At that time, it was a closed, as we call it in the paper, a closed transaction-based platform. In other words, it was a platform that enabled information ex exchange between the various partner organizations um, that were providing services on its behalf. And it was at that time that EMRIS um, was invited as, 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 um, as part of a review team from Caribou Digital uh, to be able to sort of advise and um, uh, make suggestions on UNHCR's ongoing journey. This is not a journey between, this is not an issue of sort of, it's a transaction based and now it's an innovation based, um, it was the journey itself, which is ongoing, and the paper itself tries to make a contribution to, um, to characterize, to theorize, and to try to characterize this process of platformization um, as we uh, know that term from information systems. So the way in which we try to conceptualize this opening up process um, and to draw implications um, for the main stakeholders and the sub-processes which are involved in the platformization process. I'll just briefly go over that. Um, so the focus would be on the, um, the solid line triangle in the center there, which is supposed to represent um, UNHCR's transaction-based closed loop platform as we refer to it in the paper. So as I said, this is the, the point about UNHCR working um, to facilitate information exchange with its partner organizations in camp. Um, that, that's the way in which it's been working and that's the way it still works with three key stakeholders, one, two, and three. First of all, 
the identifier itself, which is UNHCR, which I, you know, puts forward and proposes identification criteria for the refugees. Uh, number two, those who are identified, who are the refugees. And three, the third party service providing organizations. So in that first uh, um, solid line triangle there, it would be the closed system. Now, you know, obviously the, from a closed transaction based system to an, um, an open innovation platform is something that is, um, it's an incremental process. And we try to denote that with the shaded triangle uh, as it expands into an open platform. Discussions are still underway within UNHCR as to what it means by an open innovation platform. But in the paper, we do give examples of what this is. So for example, this is the ability of refugees themselves to manage um, their identification portfolio. And more importantly, the open innovation platform is about opening the digital identity platform um, to third party market players, which is a common phenomenon, not just in the humanitarian sector, but also for social protection and poverty alleviation. So within that schema, we then um, uh, identify and talk about in the paper, three key sub processes. The first one is clearly identification itself, because how refugees are identified in the first place um, has a huge bearing on the entitlements they receive and therefore on their life prospects. This is obviously a dynamic process and it is shaped by relations of power and control. The second key process right in the center of the triangle there is how is value generated from this platform when we're talking about um, refugee management? Well, here clearly uh, the issue of value depends on the priorities and the incentives of each of the key stakeholder groups, but it's heavily shaped by the ident identification process itself. And it's also heavily shaped by the way in which UNHCR as platform owner orchestrates or puts in place governance mechanisms for, um, for the creation of value to its different users of the platform. So the paper then goes on to, to try to use these constructs uh, to see what, what we found in the field. And it's the interplay between these three processes, which I think lies at the heart of our paper. So we interviewed um, UNHCR staff. We interviewed service provider organizations, which included um, uh, a partners in camp as well as third party market, uh, market um, providers, service providers, mobile network operators and financial providers, um, and um, a cohort of refugees itself. And this was based on a study in um, BDBD refugee camp in Northern Uganda, one of the largest um, camps in the world. So just to briefly touch on some of the findings, and I can't even see exactly how many minutes I've got left, but not a lot. So I'll just briefly go through them. The paper then gives more details of this platformization process and the generation of value, number one, to the UNHCR itself, increased efficiency, of course, that is one of the biggest mandates, but there are also ripple effects. It's not just the UNHCR, but one of the benefits of the platform was clearly to assist the host state ID systems because uh, the, the credentials could serve as proxy refugee status um, for, uh, for people with, who are passing through and, and taking residence in the camp. And also beyond the sector. So the fact that the uh, platform was opening up uh, to market players, it meant that UNHCR's identification criteria were instrumental um, in creating network effects um, and therefore including market players um, as, as instrumental on this platform. Nevertheless, tensions were there. And even today, there are big discussions that we talk about in the paper about to what extent does UNHCR really want to um, open up its processes and open up its systems to um, third party players. 
for service providers themselves, increased organizational coordination and service innovation is clearly one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest challenges before uh, the, um, uh, the UNHCR platform. However, several risks exist even today. And some of these have been talked about today. Um, service providers are reticent and extremely um, cautious about this opening up process, increased personal data sharing, um, especially for sensitive issues of child protection, domestic violence. What does it mean when platforms open up for the relationship, the trust relationship between the partner organizations and the refugees? And also, what does it mean for um, pro service provider organizations themselves to, um, to keep as a proprietary data set, the data on refugees and activities? Because at the end of the day, Save the Children, Action Aid, they will work in camp, but they will compete with other um, service providers as well. For refugees themselves, um, the creation of value, yes, the platform would increase access to opportunities, especially as market players enter the scene. So not just for service provision, education, employment, but also for uh, um, for increased targeting and personalization of market-based services. Um, they're able to have more management and more control over their own data, because if they can manage their identification portfolio, then this gives them a sense of, of agency and empowerment. Um, in increased risks, there is definitely the risk there of um, restructuring social relations, especially when it comes to certain identification criteria, such as female-headed households, which UNHCR puts in place for a particular efficiency reason, but it means something very different for refugees. Because if, if women-headed households are, if that is the criteria, then when the male members come and join um, in camp, they are going, this is nearly always going to lead to a situation of domestic violence. So it's a question of how sensitive are the identification criteria, which um, are put in place for one reason, for the reason of efficiency, but means something very different, both for partner organizations and for refugees. Um, there are limitations of opening up. The, the first one is one that we've already talked about, that uh, it's, the, it's the problem of the lack of host system legislation in place uh, for data protection. But also it's the case that there is um, um, a lot of reliance on international standards, ISO, F FATF standards for this opening up process. So the, the selection of criteria by UNHCR, um, which will enable market providers and tempt them to provide market services is still not, um, not decided. And finally, implications for theory and practice. Well, identification, as, as we know, it's a dynamic relationship. Um, but as we found, this relationship is right now biased towards organizations that UNHCR um, and um, other service organizations. And it's this bias that unfortunately still gets reflected in the um, criteria which are coded into the design of the platform. Value generation, we find that the degree and timing of openness is extremely important. There's a big difference between opening up to refugees to allow them to manage their portfolio and opening up to the wider market. Governance, this is the issue that UNHCR is grappling with right now to orchestrate this process of platformization and above all, to maintain its commitment to uh, refugee protection. In the paper, we end with uh, a few change management procedures. Um, I think the most important one is the first one here which is to um, ensure that there's uh, refugee and partner organization regular involvement in the design and evolution of the platform. And UNHCR is actually working with this to create an oversight board, which is localized. And the tiered approach to identity proofing is this idea that um, at the end of the day, the UNHCR's own processes are not um, solid enough to entice market service providers 
So it needs to be done in a phased manner. Uh, that, that's it. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. I'm sorry I didn't um, stick exactly to 10 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Shirin. Um, at this point in time, I will stop the 